Well, so we keep pushing. Now, I, I, I started reading um, from you when you started pushing a lot of diaspora issues, um, looking at our constitution and um, um, saying things to the effect that you thought that there were things in our constitution uh, that were not right or that you thought that some of the interpretations that were given to things in the constitution were not right, especially the right to vote um, for diasporans. That's when I started um, reading from you. And from then on, you've been very consistent. You've taken many cases to the, to the Supreme Court, all, in, all with respect to uh, constitutional interpretations and, 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 and all that. Uh, what led you into this advocacy and how uh, successful has that been? Well, remember we talked about my school days and being involved in student politics. Yeah. That was all about restoring the Constitution, which had been overthrown on December 31st, 1981. Mm. We resolved, at least some of us resolved, that if we are fortunate and the Constitution is restored, we are going to do everything within our power to defend it, to preserve it, to uphold it. So I pay very close attention to whether or not the structures in the Constitution are being followed and or whether they are being violated. Mm. And when I see any violation, I'm very quick to point it out. Uh, one of them, as you have mentioned, is the way uh, the country and recently the Supreme Court has interpreted Article 94-2A. Mm -hmm. It's completely wrong, and I think we are going to be uh, talking about it. If, let's do it now. Let, let's, let's do it yes, now. Yes. Yeah. Now, if you look at Article 94 2A, mm -hmm. it simply says, uh, let me read it. A person shall not be qualified. We'll put it up for you. Okay. Now, go on. Yeah. A person shall not be qualified to be a member of parliament mm -hmm. if he owes allegiance to a country other than Ghana. Right. And this is Article 94A of the Constitution of the Constitution 1992. Right. The simple question before the Supreme Court was, well, what is the meaning of the phrase owe oh, allegiance to a country other than Ghana? Mm -hmm. That was a simple question. Mm -hmm. And the Supreme Court reasoned that since citizens owe allegiance to countries, then it must follow that Article 94-2A is talking about dual citizens. Mm. That's the reasoning. Because they said allegiance and citizenship are interwoven and cannot be decoupled. Mm. And so when Article 94-2A says a person who owes allegiance to a country other than Ghana, then Article 94-2A must have been talking about dual citizenship. Mm. Now that is strange reasoning, Randy. Mm. Why so? Uh, because the first thing that you want to do when you are interpreting a constitution is to understand the history. If you don't understand the history, you are not really interpreting the Constitution. You are just doing English comprehension. Mm. And English comprehension is very, very different from constitutional interpretation. Now, this Article 94-2A predates the allowing of dual citizenship. Okay. So when the Constitution was promulgated in 1992, dual citizenship was not allowed. So, it absolutely makes no sense to say Article 94-2A was directed at a status that was not even allowed. Or contemplated that. Or was not even contemplated. Mm. So, that, that, if, if that is the starting point, mm. if you understand the history, then you could have, they could have avoided this problem. Mm. The second thing to mm. note mm. is if you go to Article 8 in the Constitution, Yes. Article 8 in the Constitution is an, an amended article. Yes. So it came into the Constitution in 1996. Yes. 
And in 1996, when they wanted to talk about dual citizenship, they did not say a person who owed allegiance to a country other than Ghana. No. What they said was, a citizen of Ghana may hold the citizenship of any other country in addition to his citizenship of Ghana. Okay. So Article 82 tells us that in the constitution of Ghana, when we want to talk about dual citizens, this is how you say it, a citizen of Ghana who holds another citizenship mm. in addition to his citizenship of Ghana. Mm. Then Article 82, Article 82 then goes on to say, Randy, yeah. without prejudice to Article 94-2A, okay? so it's saying, well, we are going to put in this new article, but we are going to remember that there's an existing Article 94-2A, and with that prejudice to Article 94-2A, no citizen of Ghana shall qualify to be appointed as a holder of any office specified in this clause if he holds the citizenship of any other country in addition to his citizenship of Ghana. Yeah. Then they list the positions, ambassador, secretary to the cabinet, chief of defense staff, IGP, and so on, mm. and then any office specified by an act of parliament. Yeah. Then subsequently, parliament added chief justice and so on, uh, chief justice, director general, chief fire officer, and so on and so forth. So in the constitution of Ghana, there are two independent sources of allegiance of disqualification mm. of disqualification. One is allegiance based, Article ninety four two A, and then two dual citizenship based, which is Article A two. And they tell us that if you are a dual citizen, you cannot hold certain positions. Why? Because dual citizens owe citizenship-based allegiance to a country other than Ghana. Mm. Independent of that, if you also owe allegiance to a country other than Ghana, as defined in Article 94.2a, Mm -hmm. Article 94.2a is not citizenship based. And we know that because Article 94.2a was inserted in the Constitution at a time when dual citizenship was not even allowed. Yeah. So there's a citizenship based disqualification in Article 82 and a non citizenship based disqualification in Article 94.2a. So, so, so let, me, let, me, let me just understand this. What you're saying is that. Uh, for 94-2A, there's a possibility that a person holds only Ghanaian citizenship, only Ghanaian citizenship, but could hold allegiance to a country other than Ghana. Yes. Without necessarily holding a citizenship of another country. Absolutely. And that's the reason they have 94-2A. Yes. And they explain yes. when you go and you read the memorandum yes. accompanying the 1969 yes. constitution, yes. the constituent assembly's work, they explain that they have this allegiance clause because they want to disqualify people in occupations that are incompatible with serving as MPs. So that is in the uh, Constituent Assembly's work? That is there. That, they didn't do any research. If they did any, if they did any research at all, they would have seen yeah, it. Yeah, but that, that, that is what explains the reasoning behind the enactment. Yes, absolutely. That's why I'm saying, you, if you start reading the Constitution as if you are doing practical so, so English... For the benefit of our viewers, give me a classical example of... Allegiance without citizenship. Well, let's give the, the most basic example. Yes. When we swear in a president, yes. the president takes an oath of allegiance. Yes. That is not an oath of citizenship. Yes. That is a job-related oath. Yes. The justices of the Supreme Court, yes. they swear an oath of allegiance. Yes. That has nothing to do with citizenship. Yes. If 
you join a military, mm -hmm. you would swear an oath of allegiance. That has nothing to do with citizenship. So let's say you are a Ghanaian and you are resident in the United States. Mm -hmm. You can join the U.S. Army. With a green card. With a green card. Okay. And with that green card, you would swear an oath of allegiance. Okay. Even though you are not... So that oath of allegiance is to the United States? It's to the United States because okay. you are serving in the U.S. Army. So although you hold only a Ghanaian citizenship, you have sworn allegiance to a country other than Ghana? Yes. Okay. And, and then, the, the, I, I know you have been around for a while, so mm -hmm. you may recall the swap of Susudis. Yes. And Piersan, yes. and yes. Busse, and yes. others. Yes. Susudis was accused by the U.S. of extracting information from a CIA lady. Mm -hmm. And there was a question of what to do with them. So they, there was some mutual exchange. Mm -hmm. The U.S. had some people in Ghana working for them. Yes. And those Ghanaian citizens. Ghanaian citizens, not yes. Boa citizens, Ghanaian yeah. citizens. Those people were described as CIA assets. Mm -hmm. So the U.S., was willing to swap subsidies for about eight Ghanaians. Mm -hmm. It is these type of people and the allegiance that they owe that constitute a threat to their being in the legislature. That is why Article 94 2A was inserted. Mm -hmm. Article 94 2A could not have been inserted because of citizenship. Mm -hmm. Because citizenship, dual citizenship, was not even allowed. Mm -hmm. Any homework, if you had done, if they had done any homework, mm. they would have avoided the type of interpretation that they gave. Let, let's get matter. back to exactly what the Constituent Assembly said. Okay. So that that would be what the the spirit behind um, ninety four two. Yeah, ninety four two. Okay. A. That's the reasoning yes. behind ninety four two. So what, what, what did the Constituent Assembly say for this? Uh, they said yes. They are advocating that people who are in occupations mm -hmm. that are incompatible, mm -hmm. naturally incompatible mm -hmm. with serving as legislatures okay. should be disqualified. Okay. That is the reason. Okay. And the examples of, uh, I've given you examples okay. of that. So you are saying that per, per the construction and the rationale which is uh, founded in the Constituent Assembly's work, what was contemplated here was the situation where there are people who hold only Ghanaian citizenship, yet they owe allegiance to countries other than Ghana. Precisely. And that's the examples that you've given. Precisely. That, for example, there could be a Ghanaian who is enlisted into the U.S. Army or the British Army. They don't need to hold British citizenship to be in there. But to be enlisted, they swear allegiance. Precisely. And this is what the Constitution was contemplating. In Article 94 2. Okay. And it is also very easy to see because the language itself mm. is a term of art. Right. It is used in the constitutions of many countries, especially Commonwealth countries, because mm. it was something that the British exported to all their colonies. Mm. So if you look at the Australian Constitution, which the court cites in the judgment, they cited section 44I. Mm. And section 44I is important. I hope you can show it to your viewers. Section 44I okay. of the Australian Constitution. Yes, yes, yes. yes. It says any yes. person who is under any acknowledgement of allegiance obedience or adherence to a foreign power comma mm -hmm. that comma is important because yes. the it the first point is under any acknowledgement of allegiance obedience or adherence to a foreign power that is something very similar to our article 94 2a because this is saying if you owe allegiance the ad things if you owe allegiance to a foreign power mm -hmm. you, you, you follow yeah then they go on to say, or is a subject or a citizen. So that is another wing. A subject or a citizen of a foreign power. That mm. is our Article 8. Yes. Because that's dual citizen. Yes. And then there's a third wing, or entitled to the rights or privileges of a subject 
mm. or a citizen of a foreign power. Mm. That is the third limb. Mm. So there, in this section 44i, mm. there are three limbs. One is a person who is under any acknowledgement of allegiance. Our court will say, well, once you're under an acknowledgement of allegiance, then you are a, a dual citizen. So our court will say, Australian section 44 is saying, any person who is a dual citizen or a dual citizen or a dual citizen, mm. merely because he see, they are seeing the word allegiance. Mm. And that's because they are unable to reason that one could owe allegiance for reasons unrelated to citizenship. What this Australian section is telling us is one can owe allegiance, that's the first limb, and then one can owe allegiance because they are a citizen, that's the second limb, mm -hmm. and then they even have a third limb. They say one can owe allegiance because one is entitled to the rights or privileges of a subject or a citizen of a foreign power. Mm -hmm. They cite this case wrongly because if you if they had actually studied the case mm. the case specifically says let me see if i can quote from it yeah but the case specifically tells us that they are dealing with the second limb they are dealing with the second limb let's see here which is about citizenship which is about dual citizenship okay the person gallagher who was being challenged who was being uh, whose uh, citizenship was being evaluated mm. was accused of having dual citizenship mm. she didn't even know that he was a citizen of uk mm -hmm. because under the uk law many people born in the colonies were automatic citizens in fact if we apply the law mm. the way the australians apply it mm. we would disqualify everyone who was born before 1957 right. because everyone who was born before 1957 is a uk subject or a uk citizen mm. But here, if I can see it, it says here, um, it says, the words subject and citizen of a foreign power, which appear in section 44i, connote the existence of state of affairs involving the existence of a status or of rights referable to such a status under the law of the foreign power. Then they go on to say, the second limb mm -hmm. of section 44i is concerned with the existence of a duty by a person to a foreign power as an aspect of the status of citizenship. Mm -hmm. So they, the case that they cited should have told them two things. Owing allegiance is different in constitutional law mm -hmm. from being a dual citizen. Mm -hmm. I've heard people say that any time you refer to 94.2, you should read it um, jointly with Article 8. And that if you do not do so, you miss, you miss the point. Yes, absolutely. And that's the point I'm making. Mm. Because Article 94.2, when you read it and you start thinking it's dual citizenship, then when you go to Article 8, Article 8 actually describes dual citizenship. Mm. It tells you in our constitution, if we want to talk about the dual citizen, we call them a citizen of Ghana who has the citizenship of another country. Mm -hmm. So that is the term. And if you don't find that term, then don't force to make citizenship uh, the issue because citizenship is not the issue. So the point you're making is that if the framers of a constitution intended for 94-2A to refer to dual citizens, they would have clearly stated that a person shall not be qualified to be a member of parliament if he holds the citizenship of another country. Yes, Is that absolutely. the point you're making? Well, that's not the point. That's the point I'm making. Yes. But more important, it, would have, it wouldn't have made any sense because dual citizenship was not even allowed. Yes. So in 1992, if you were a Ghanaian and you had the citizenship of another country, you automatically would lose your Ghanaian citizenship. Yes. This... Article 8 that you are reading yes. was inserted in 1996. Yes. And in inserting it, they specifically added positions that dual citizens Cannot could not hold. Yes. And they didn't add the positions in Article 94. They didn't. They actually said without prejudice. Mm -hmm. That is telling you they understand the difference between Article 8 and Article uh, 94 too, because they are saying if you are a dual citizen, mm -hmm. then you automatically you cannot hold all these positions. You cannot be an ambassador, you cannot be a secretary, and so on. But if you are a dual citizen who is also spying 
for another country, then you cannot be qualified to be in parliament. So what you're saying is that the 8-1, the 8-1, enlisting the offices, including the amendments that were made by parliament when the, the bill was presented to them, did not include the office of a member of parliament. Yes. And that if the intention was to include that, it would have been added. Absolutely. And so your point is that interpreting 94-2 to include the office of a member of parliament is wrong. It's absolutely wrong because that is, you are just forcing it. The constitution doesn't say that. You are just forcing it because you have misconstrued the meaning of owing allegiance to a country other than Ghana as used in Article 94-2A. Hmm. In constitutional law, when we want to say a citizen owes allegiance, right? Mm -hmm. We don't say it because just saying citizen, the, it's inherently the notion of owing allegiance is inherent in citizenship itself. Mm. When it is spelled out that you owe allegiance to a country other than Ghana, then that is a different term. That is a different term. And we, we, we can see that from the Australian constitution itself. Mm. The other thing about the Australian uh, section 44i, I want to raise this right here because yes. there was another problem there. Mm. It says, if you look at the very last sentence, it says, such a person shall be incapable of being chosen, incapable of being chosen or sitting as a senator or a member of the House of Rep Representatives. Mm. You see what they've done? Yeah. They, they have two things. You are incapable of being chosen mm -hmm. or you are disqualified from sitting as a senator. Mm. The court relies on the dates in the Australian case to justify the date it set for our Article 94-2A. But our Article, our, our Article 94-2A merely says a person is not qualified to be an MP. That is referring to sitting as an MP, not incapable of being chosen as an MP. We don't have anything which says a person is incapable of being chosen as an MP if he owes allegiance to a country other than Ghana. How do you reconcile the statement you're making with the PNDC Law 284? PNDC Law 284 is also very clear because if you look at PNDC Law 284, mm -hmm. Section 9 1. Yes. If you look at Section 9 1, yes. Section 9 1 says what? A person shall not be qualified to be a candidate for the office of member of parliament unless he is a citizen of Ghana, has attained the age of 21 years, and is a registered voter, resident, stroke hall from, paid all taxes or made arrangements satisfactory to the appropriate authority. Very good. Stop right there. Yes. So that is the Zaneto case. Okay. You are not qualified to be a candidate. Mm -hmm. See? Yes. Qualified to be a candidate. Yes. Now, if you go to night 2, night 2 is now going to be talking about Article 94.2 yes. and read Article 94.2. So it says, that the 2842 says, a person shall not be qualified to be a member of parliament if he, A, owes allegiance to a country other than Ghana. Precisely. Okay. So you see the distinction between the two. Okay. One is, you are not even qualified to be a candidate. A candidate. Mm -hmm. That is the Australian version of you are incapable of being chosen. Mm -hmm. That is what 94, that is what section 9 1 is saying. Mm -hmm. And then when it goes to section 9 2, mm -hmm. it says you are not qualified as an MP. You are not qualified if to you sit. owe allegiance. If you owe allegiance, however you define it. Are you are you suggesting that by virtue of the 2842? A person who owes allegiance to a country is not disqualified from being a candidate. No, because but is only disqualified from becoming a member of parliament. Yes, that's what the, that's what it says, right? I mean, I'm not saying it. I yes. mean, anybody at all can read it. The only thing I've done is I've highlighted the a candidate. So, so the point you're making is that if the intent of the two was to disqualify those who owe allegiance from becoming candidates, they would have said so expressly. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what do you then say to those who say that becoming an MP is not an event, it's a process. It starts from somewhere. So you cannot just be speaking about when the person is elected, announced, or when 
is made a candidate by the Electoral Commission or when he's sworn in in Parliament, but it must be from when he starts the process of wanting to become an MP. Then he should rewrite the Constitution and make it similar to what we have in Section 91, or they should use the Australian language, Australia language, which says you shall be incapable of being chosen. But you cannot just make it up when the Constitution doesn't say so. Is, is that not what the Supreme Court has done by its ruling? By perhaps identifying that uh, perhaps there are some, some ambiguity or, or, or mistakes with, with the drafting, and therefore it has used these decisions to, to, to clarify. No, the drafting is perfect. Those who wrote PNDC Law 284 mm -hmm. are actually very smart because they, look at, they took the Constitution and they distinguish between Article 94.1 and Article 94.2. If you read Article 94... Well, they would have done this before the Constitution. Yeah, well, yes. no. They, they, okay. Yeah. Well, look at, if you look at Article 94.1, yes. it says a person shall not be unless... Mm -hmm. And then if you look at Article 94.2, it says a person shall not be if. Mm -hmm. The unless and if. These are not random words. Mm -hmm. Unless means you are not even eligible. You are not eligible to be a candidate. Mm -hmm. If means we don't want you to sit in our parliament. Mm -hmm. If you are a bankrupt or you owe allegiance and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So the words matter. If the words do not matter, then we really don't even have to talk about constitutional law because they, we live in uh, a society where judges make the rules. Mm. Mm. And, and again, yes. I want to stress yes. that the court justifies its timelines by referencing the Australian case. Mm -hmm. But that was wrong because the Australian case was dealing with the phrase which is shall be incapable of being chosen mm -hmm. as an MP. Mm -hmm. which is very similar to our section 9-1. Okay. But our law on allegiance kicks in when you are about to enter NP. And then there is a very important section in the representation of the people's law, mm -hmm. the PNDC law 284, mm -hmm. section 20. Yes. If you look at section 20, yes. it tells you, look, don't cancel elections mm. if at the time of the election a person is qualified to run. So section 20 is a grounds for cancelling election results. The election of a candidate shall be declared void on an election petition if the high court is satisfied D, that a candidate was at the time of his election a person not qualified or a person disqualified for election. Yeah. Elections are expensive. Mm. Don't go and remove someone and go and do a by-election and bring back that same person. Mm. So if at the time of the election, the person is qualified, let him go. You may find him for not submitting a form on a timely basis, or you may reprimand him. But don't set aside the voice of the people because the voice of the people really happens to be the voice of God. That is what Section 21D is telling us, that, look, elections are expensive. So even if somebody was not qualified before the election, but he shows that at the time of the election he was qualified, then don't cancel the election. You can find some other remedy. You can find some other way to... Uh... But this, this was available to the Supreme Court. Yeah, the Supreme Court believed that... Um, he had to be disqualified. Yeah, I mean, uh, look, I, I knew the Supreme Court was going to disqualify him long ago. Why? Because if they are not going to disqualify you, they won't put an injunction on, on you for one and a half years. There is no court in the world that will injunct an MP for 15 months. So look, representation is at the heart of what we do. And if you remember, the, uh, there was an earlier case where the Supreme Court was even saying that even in particular decision, we shouldn't disqualify an MP from making a decision just on, on, on one decision in mm. Parliament. Mm. It's so important that a person who is a deputy speaker should be allowed to vote. Mm. That is how important representation was to the Supreme Court at that time. But in this case, representation... That was recent. That was on the Joe Wise issue. That, yes, yes, absolutely. Yes. But on this other 
case, mm. representation was no longer important, mm. and they put an injunction on the guy for 15 months. As long as they were willing to put the injunction, then reasonable people should have known that this is going to be the outcome. By the way, look at what the court said. Mm -hmm. The court said Article 94-2A means somebody who has dual citizenship, and that person should file his papers or should show that he has renounced his citizenship at the time he files the nomination. Mm. How is that different from what the High Court said in Cape Coast? That is just the same thing that the High Court said. Yeah. So if that is all the court was going to tell us, then we should have you know, stayed with the High Court decision. Mm. This thing here, other than all the mistakes that anyone can pick up, mm. really repeats what the High Court judge said. Mm. And Strangely enough, the defendants, Jack Chikwesin and his team, mm. tried many times to get the court, Supreme Court to interpret Article 94-2A. All of the... The last decision that I saw was a 5-2 against them. But when the plaintiff decided that he was going to seek the meaning of, of Article 94-2A, the plaintiff was welcome. Not only was the plaintiff welcome, they welcomed the plaintiff by injuncting the MP. And then the injunction was left in place for almost 15 months. And then after 15 months, they came to tell us what the High Court told us. Mm. By misinterpreting Article 94 to a, by ignoring the statutes at the PNDC Law 284, mm. by misapplying Australian case law, mm. and by forgetting that Article 20, uh, PNDC Law 284, 21D tells us don't cancel elections when at the time of the election, the person is qualified. Mm. So that is the big, 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 big problem. So, so, so where do we go from here? This is a decision of the Supreme Court. It has far-reaching implications. I mean, this is a precedent. How do we go around this? Well, there are two ways. Mm. Uh, one, a little bit optimistic. The other, more realistic. Mm -hmm. The little bit optimistic will be for the defendant. And then when you file for review, raise all these issues that you are raising. What was the what was the what was the the outcome of the initial one in terms of the voting? Was it unanimous? It was unanimous. So why would he go for a review if it was unanimous? Well, you assume that you are going to talk to people who are honest, and if you make a solid argument, they would accept. But you'd only have two two persons, other than those who had the initial issue. Yeah, but those who yes. had the initial issues mm. can re change their your mind. arguments yes. and say, oh, wow, well, we missed that because Article 94.2a predates dual citizenship. So our holding that allegiance is interwoven with citizenship is wrong on its face on, on its face is wrong it cannot be correct mm. because article 94 2 a had an independent existence mm. before the arrival of dual citizenship number mm. two uh, in the constitution constitution itself there's a way that we talk about dual citizens we say a citizen of ghana who has the citizenship of another country so that is dual citizenship mm. a person who owes allegiance is a different concept in law, we have a principle called the principle of meaningful variation. Mm. Third, the Australian case that we cited, we cited it wrongly. Mm. In both allegiance and citizenship, we mm. got it wrong. Mm. And in the timing, we got it wrong as well. Mm. Four, we have to wrestle with modern concepts of citizenship. Nobody today thinks about citizenship in terms of subjects and allegiance and all that. People think about citizenship in terms of rights. That is why in Celerion, in Nigeria, they've held that you cannot have a citizen and tell that citizen that he cannot go to parliament. Because going to parliament is at the heart of representative government. Mm. And if you have, I don't know whether the court even tried to find out how many people will be affected by this decision, but by my estimates, there are about 10% of the people who are dual citizens. Mm. That would be 3 million people. Mm. So you are going to tell 3 million people that they are not eligible to go to parliament. Mm. And mind you, if you are not eligible to go to parliament, 
that disqualifies you from many other things. Mm. So, for instance, you cannot be on the executive as well. Mm. You cannot be on any constitutional commission. Mm -hmm. So, for besides the EC, the NCC, and so on, you cannot be a founding member, a leading, a leader, or even an executive member of a political party. Mm -hmm. So, that, those are the considerations. The second one is to amend the constitution, to repeal it, to repeal Article A2 and Article 94 2A, which is what we have been working on, advocating. Fortunately, there seems to be bipartisanship around that issue. The Council of State... Is that your private member's bill? That's a private member's bill, yes. Okay. Uh, written by Kennedy Ose Nyaku. Yes, the MP. Yeah, the MP yes. from Swedro. Mm. So there is some bipartisanship around that. Uh, the president supports it. As president Mahama supports it. The NDC caucus supports it. NPP caucus supports it. Mm. So let's come together, learn from this experience, repeal it, and then move on as a nation, uh, Nigeria, Celerion, UK, US, Canada, and a variety of countries allow their dual citizens to participate freely mm. in their parliament and in other things, and nothing wrong has happened to those mm. countries. Now, now there's, there's something. You sign off a lot of your, your or almost all, your, your writings on uh, social media with um, Sal is still the cardinal scene of the Fourth Republic. Uh, we saw an administrative directive by the Electoral Commission on, I think, the 5th of December, uh, 2020, asking the people of uh, uh, San Trophy, Akbafu, uh, Lekpe and Lolobi uh, to vote in only the presidential election or the parliamentary election. We have some uh, uh, 18 months or so to go for the end of this, this, this particular uh, term as far as uh, Parliament is concerned. And from all indications, the Electoral Commission has even indicated that that will only feature for 2024. That's the Parliament of 2025. And you keep making the point that it's a cardinal scene. It appears that uh, the rest of us don't see it as a cardinal scene. Uh, doing some research on it uh, recently, I saw um, an agent question asked of the Attorney General. And in Attorney General's response to Parliament, he makes the point that he thinks that that decision was wrong, especially a decision to create the new district, which then led to the SAL situation. And he provided some ways of remedying the situation. But that's where it's ended. Yeah, I mean, that's another example of serious things that we don't take seriously in the country uh, because there's no democracy anywhere in the world where some of the people can be disenfranchised and then nothing happens. But in Ghana, it's par for the course. Uh, even in this case that we are just discussing, the Asinov case, uh, the Electoral Commission refused to go to defend its decisions because the Electoral Commission should have gone to explain why it, it allowed Kwesin to, to run. Especially and, when there was a petition. Yeah, the Electoral Commission yes. would have said, I was following the law. I was following uh, PNDC law section 9-2. Mm. And maybe that would have changed the mind of the court. But they didn't show up. Mm. And they are not held accountable. They, mm. The Electoral Commissioner is a duty bearer. Mm. Whether the Electoral Commission likes the candidate or not, whether he agrees with the candidate or not, if the work of the Electoral Commission is questioned, it has a duty to go to court to explain that. And if it doesn't go to court to explain that, then the Electoral Commissioner must be held accountable, mm. including even initiating removal proceedings, because that's the only way that you are going to get these uh, duty bearers to do their job. Mm. And the same thing with Sal. Mm. I mean, Sal is dead. Uh, nobody says anything. But the reality is we disenfranchise people, and we have not held anyone accountable for that mistake, for that mistake that should never have happened. Did the Electoral Commission have any power? either under the Constitution or any um, um, LI or CI, to have taken the decision that it, it took on the 5th of December? No, absolutely not. It was by fiat. It was by fiat, mm. you know, because it had no power. And uh, it probably believed that if it did it, nothing would happen. And we've proven uh, them correct that nothing has happened. But also with the government, knowing very well that there are consequences of creating a new district, because we've said that no constituency shall straddle two districts. And so knowing the consequences of creating a new district out of um, an existing constituency, uh, we knew the implications. 
and and we knew that taking that decision with some four months or so to an election this will be the implications and no, yet no. the government went ahead no i don't think that would be the implications i okay. mean if you have only four months to go to elections mm. then regardless of what the government is doing mm. as the independent electoral commissioner mm. you are fixated on making sure that everyone in the country belongs to a constituency and they get to vote in that constituency. Mm -hmm. You cannot let the government be influencing what, what you do. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, the government will merely go to uh, places where it doesn't have support mm -hmm. and start creating all kinds of districts two weeks to the election. Mm -hmm. And the electoral government says, oh, the government has created a district, therefore don't vote. I mean, that, that doesn't... No, I'm saying that to the extent that the practice is that, or the law is that, no two constituencies, no one constituency shall straddle two districts. To the extent that that is the situation. Yeah. Now, if a government, um, on the basis of its power, decides to create a new district and sends it to parliament and has the numbers to pass it through and therefore has created another district out of an existing constituency, which means that parts of the district will be in another constituency and therefore you'd have a constituency straddling two districts, which is against the law. What does the Electoral Commission do? Well, the, the, the solution is simple. If there is adequate room, adequate time to create the constituency to reflect that district that has been created, then you do that. But if there's no room, mm. then you freeze your electoral map and create the constituency after the impending election. Otherwise, you are going to encourage the government to act opportunistically by creating these districts, which then upset the electoral map. So the electoral map, at some point, should be frozen because there's no time to create new district, uh, mm. to create new constituencies. Mm. So you could go up ahead and create all kinds of districts. But once we get to that time, no new constituencies will be created. That's okay. the solution. All right, Prof, let's end on this one. The ROPA. Where are we? Well, the ROPA, of course, it's already law. So it comes to just implementation. And I think, if I recall correctly, the Electoral Commission started to do something about it before the COVID. And so the COVID may have slowed the process. Uh, I don't know where they are now, but one of the things that we may want to look at is to create overseas constituencies. So let's say you may give North America two constituencies and Europe two constituencies and so on, so that people, when they vote They'll be voting for an MP to come and represent those constituencies and then spend some time to work through how we are going to vote for president. Mm. Uh, the, the, the start. Would you be expecting those people to vote for only an, an MP and not a president? Uh, on a pilot basis, as a start. Okay, so start. you think we must pilot it? I think when the project is so big, if you go in full strength, you may run into unexpected Because problems. I've heard people who make the point that, look, um, if you're going to do ROPA, then every Ghanaian um, living everywhere uh, must be given the opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. No problem with that. Mm. But that's what I'm saying. It's, such a, it's, such a, it's a very big it's problem. It's an operational nightmare. So let's start with the pilot mm -hmm. and then learn from that. Mm. Tweak it. So maybe by two election cycles, then we figured it out. And then we can do the full-blown thing where everybody is voting and everybody is voting for president. Mm. But in some of these countries, like Senegal, mm. they've created overseas constituencies. Mm. And then there's not a lot of fight because people don't think you are going to dilute their constituency or whatever. You guys are voting for your own MP. I think people can live with that. Mm. And then from there, we move on to bigger things. Mm.